welcome, Kathy. Um, this is just a half hour discussion. And uh, um, my name is Jen Mixes Olds. Um, I am the chair of this committee on ocean acoustics education and expertise. Um, we have been, as a committee, we've been having multiple information gathering sessions and we've had them on higher education, early career professionals, um, outreach and DEI, workforce development. And um, I know that you were invited to the higher education um, information gathering session that you weren't, that your schedule was not in, um, in conjunction with that. So we, we didn't want to miss having that discussion with you. So thank you, first off, for just spending 30 minutes with us. Um, and um, the way I think we'll just jump right into it, I'm going to just introduce myself and the committee briefly, and then turn it over to you to allow you time to interest, introduce yourself um, to the committee, and then we can just jump into discussion. So I have just two other slides here. Um, again, my name is Jen Mixes Olds. I'm the chair of this committee. I am from the University of New Hampshire, where I serve as the director um, of the Center for Acoustics Research and Education. And these are um, our committee members. I'm joined by Andrea Anguelas from Penn State, Art Baggerer from MIT, Lisa Hodling from Idos Education, Wu Zhang Li from the University of Washington, Carolyn Rupel from USGS, Yale Scowcroft from the University of Rhode Island, and Preston Wilson from the University of Texas, Austin. Not everybody was able to make it today, but as you saw at the beginning, we are recording this um, number one, so it can be reviewed by those that committee members that weren't able to join us today. And it does become part of the public archive in association with the information gathering effort for the committee. Um, this is the statement of task for our committee given by our Office of Naval Research sponsor. It is heavily ocean acoustics related. And I understand that you may not have a, a you know a full ocean acoustics background. <laughs> um, <but laughs> we, we hope that um, your insight into um, interdisciplinary science and education will really help us inform um, number four here, exploration of strategies to raise the profile of careers in ocean acoustics, including education, training, uh, workforce recruitment, and retention. Um, ocean acoustics is a highly interdisciplinary field, and we recognize that there are other highly interdisciplinary fields that um, we hope to learn more from that we can bring into our field. There have been... Um, the, the one I keep coming back to is highly interdisciplinary is forensics and um, some of the challenges associated with other interdisciplinary fields, maybe sharing some successes in that area or um, recommendations or, or challenges and how you can resolve them. So any of that is, is open to discussion. Um, but before we get into that, I'm going to, do you have slides to share for your introduction or would you just like me to stop sharing? I don't have any slides. Then let me stop sharing so we can all see each other a little bit bigger than a teeny little postage stamp. There we go. So the floor is yours, Kathy. Um, I'm Kathy Manduka. I was the founding director of the Science Education Resource Center at Carleton College. Um, that center was funded um, large, is funded largely by the National Science Foundation um, and other um, granting agencies. And um, it has over 20 years been um, a engine for um, faculty professional development and, and in particular, the development of online resources for teaching um, coming out of that faculty development. So that work was all grounded in um, the notion of, of a large scale community of practice or community of transformation, we would call it now. But at the time when it was started, it was all about faculty talking to each other and helping each other understand what they were doing in the classroom and um, collectively solving problems and sharing resources. I also served as the executive director of the National Association of Geoscience Teachers for um, 
I guess about 10 years. And um, that organization um, serves uh, both faculty and K-12 teachers. And so along the way, I um, did a large amount of work that involved um, or was proximal to K-12 teacher um, preparation in addition to higher education. CERC expanded out of the geosciences and did a lot of, and still does a lot of work, um, both um, in institutional transformation and in other disciplines we've, and with two-year colleges and a you know, large variety of, of people that we collaborated with making use of this strategy of, of um, bringing together groups of people who had a shared interest and need and helping them to learn from each other and then share um, resources and collectively build resources. Perhaps most interesting to you um, was um, over the last decade I spent, um, I had a large NSF center grant that was focused on um, uh, teaching geoscience in the context of societal issues, um, both in geoscience programs and then across the curriculum. So that project really um, worked at um, how to make the geosciences visible in other parts of the curriculum, and then how to um, build interdisciplinary collaborations that would um, support um, teaching, um, high high quality teaching in the context of societal issues. So that's, is there anything else you want to know about me? That is perfect. And it is the perfect lead into the question. My first question actually is, um, I'm very interested to learn a little bit more about your geosciences education NSF grant that you just talked about in raising the visibility of geosciences. What do you think um, was the most productive or successful outcome of that? How did you how did you raise that visibility? Because that is something that our field um, can learn a lot about raising the uh, visibility of a field and its value then really plays right into recruitment and retention to the field. So I was interested on your thoughts on what worked and what didn't. Yeah, so um, I think that I think that the most successful piece of that in terms of raising visibility was moving geoscience into the into classes and other disciplines. And we were more, it was easier. It turned out it was a lot easier to um, uh, build interdisciplinary um, general education or introductory courses that were external to other disciplines than it was to um, actually get somebody in a, a, a different field to teach a, a unit that involved geoscience. So we were very successful at that in a lot of different places. So like, we um we had collaborative the way the project worked was that we brought together teams of faculty um and there was a rule that the teams were generally um around 3 people and there was a rule that um well actually that's not true that we did two kinds of teams we did teams that did um two week modules and we did teams that did whole courses and the two week module teams were 3 people and the um teams for um whole courses were up to 5 people and um, and there was a, a for the interdisciplinary courses, and I wish we had done this for all courses, but or all uh, materials. There was a rule that you had to have at least one geoscientist and at least one not geoscientist. So that simple rule meant that that and every every person who participated in the curriculum development had to teach the course, had to use the materials in their own course. So that meant that the materials got used. Um, they had to be developed in a way that they could be used in um, uh, the the teaching load of the faculty member who was not in the geosciences, and they got used in that course. Um, and that had a couple of outcomes. One is that it, it meant that because three people developed the materials and they all had to use them, the materials were quite adaptable. And um, so they could be used in a lot of different contexts by a lot of different kinds of faculty. And then the second outcome was that um, because of this, because we had all of these faculty who were not geoscientists teaching them, um, then that got uh, the geosciences out into other parts of the curriculum. Um, that So the scale up strategy um, was twofold. Um, on the one hand, we did a lot of work to document, so this is what CERC did or CERC does really well is that um, we documented the materials and put, published them online with examples of people teaching them in different ways so they were really usable. So the online resources were available, uh, the resources were available online in a 
in a package that was really usable and supported the faculty and teaching with them. That turned out, so we have big spread of effect just from that. I don't know how much of that spread of effect was from um, our spread of, uh, that dissemination was outside the geosciences. I, we don't have a, you know, the grant ended and there wasn't a mechanism for finding that out post, um, post funding. Um, the other strategy was a, a we, this was a large one time only NSF grant. And um, the other strategy we used was to have um, schools uh, propose um, projects that were, uh, that made use of the materials or generated new materials. And, and those projects, many of them were interdisciplinary and that led to, you know, um, for example, um, university, one of the, there was a university that um, decided it was going to teach all about rivers across the curriculum. And so they picked that up and used many different materials in different parts of the curriculum, um, focusing on their local river watershed. So that kind of strategy where you went from, you had materials and then you you scaled up by having a, 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 a institutionally based or departmental based or um, project that made use of them worked quite well. So when, um, when you said schools, um, was that what level schools were you talking about? College. Oh, these these were all undergraduate. This is all undergraduate work. Okay, schools within an undergraduate university. Got it. Not a K through twelve type school. Got it. Right. So, oh, I see. Um, Wu Zhang has a question. One from one of our committee members. Go ahead, Wu Zhang. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that was that was uh so great to learn about. Uh, I have a follow up question. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, what was the strategies? Uh, that was used to attract uh, these faculties or teachers to try to teach this? Like, was there sort of specific angles you try to go into? Or was it, I guess, like, part of it is also, does it come from the instructors, the faculty, or does it come from more like a school or a department-oriented sort of general direction? Sure. So um, the, the teams that developed the teaching materials were all faculty, and they were all... Um, uh, at, at the teams were required to have faculty from um, three different institutions. So they were multi-institutional teams. And um, the way we, so we did had two strategies for attracting them. One we had used many times before, which was to have workshops, um, what we called workshops, which were, were um, different than NS, NAS workshops. They were actual meetings where um, 20 to 100 people would come together on a topic of common interest and they would present what they were currently doing. They would learn from some people who were um, uh, important to, to the general problem, but not doing exactly what they were doing. So we'd bring in uh, you know, a cognitive scientist or an educational expert or something that was relevant to them. And then they would um, produce something collectively at the end. Um, sometimes that was material, sometimes it, it was uh, a summary, sometimes, and that what they produced was oftentimes self-generated by the work, by the workshop. Um, that allowed us both to find out what was going on, you know, so that we weren't reinventing the wheel, we were building on what was currently going on, and to identify people who might be interested, and to um, uh you know, and to advertise the fact that this other opportunity was coming up. And um, one that you might be interested in was we were very interested in trying to get geoscience into um, into the engineering curriculum. <laughs> so so one one of the workshops, which was held at at um, School of Mines, Colorado School of Mines, was geoscientists and engineers. And in retrospect, I wish we'd also had some social scientists there because they would have everybody was really very interested in going in that direction. But anyway, from that, they sort of, we, we learned a lot about, the geoscientists learned a lot about what the engineers were doing. The engineers learned a lot about what the geoscientists were doing. All of them knew in advance that they were gonna come and, and um, develop some ideas for curriculum modules that would be geoscience and engineering that could be taught in either curriculum. And from that, we got um, a number of people who went on and did both courses and, and um, uh, teaching materials. Um, so that was that that I think it's a good general strategy, both because it allows you to develop. And of, and of course, there were people we kept the names and addresses of all the people who came to that workshop. So not all of them developed materials, but then all of them could get informed when the materials were developed. So, you know, that was a sort of a community building um, strategy. 
The other thing that we did with this particular grant was we paid them a lot of money and that was very effective in recruiting people. <laughs> and, um, uh, and it was quite interesting in this case because it turned out that, um, you know, we said, you know, you're going to get, I, we paid them, I think we paid them $7,000 to do a two week module on a team of three. And that sounded like a lot more money than they should get, but it meant that they had to develop materials test them in their classes, revise them after they were tested. They worked with an a, a evaluation team that um, looked at, at them both from a pedagogic standpoint and collected data on student learning. And they had to revise. Um, that group oversaw the revisions, so they had to revise. And then they had to publish them. And getting them through to publication, you know, faculty love to develop new materials and try them, but they do not like to revise them and they do not like to publish them. And so having sufficient money that we could just really herd them through all of that um, turned out to be quite important. Awesome. That is an awesome answer. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm frantically taking notes. Um, I see Gail has her hand up. Gail? Yes. Hi, Kathy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, could uh, I, I'm very intrigued about um, the integration of these modules across disciplines. Could you give us an example of um, one, a module that you thought was very successful and then uh, which disciplines were able then to actually embed it into their curriculum. I mean, you, I know you just mentioned um, one that was um, between geosciences and engineering, but I'm wondering if you could be a little more specific and give us, uh, you know, the topic and then how they were able to translate that to be used, you know, in, in different fields. Sure. I'm going to um, put in the chat the um, website for you guys. And um, uh so um, I think there are a couple of different kinds of answers to that question. As I said, one of the most successful strategies was that we got um, we got uh, these interdisciplinary courses um, that people could learn about. I should say at this point that we were not particularly successful in recruiting out of these we raised the visibility of geoscience, but we were not particularly successful in recruiting people into geoscience majors. And we were more successful in recruiting people into environmental science majors, perhaps not too surprisingly. So I don't want to take you down a, um, <laughs> a happy path that's not a true, true, true path. Um, the, there there were a wide, so there's a couple of different kinds of interdisciplinarity that went on here. So um, there were there were modules that were developed that went from geoscience to things like environmental health or um, uh, uh, natural um, uh, disaster management um, kinds of things. And there, so when I think about ocean, ocean acoustics, I think about things like, okay, what are the other kinds of acoustics? And can you get bridges from say medical acoustics or, you know, I don't know what the other, that's the one I know about. I, there's an engineering acoustics, I'm sure. So, you know, thinking about those would be kind of easy bridges. And we got a lot, we got a lot of uh, modules that were jointly developed that went ge geology or geoscience and geography, which is kind of that kind of nearest neighbor um, approach. Um, then there were other ones that were a lot further afield, like um, there were a number of them that were taught in um, uh, literature or um, uh, humanities courses. And there, you know, the literature people are looking for, you know, either books or kinds of writing or, um, uh, you know, um, kinds of writing, you know, kinds of writing styles where, where it doesn't matter so much what the, it matters a lot what the content is, but there's a lot of variety in the kinds of content, right? So so that was another kind of sort of easy, um, relatively easy cross, um, uh, particularly, um, and there were, the one of the ones I love is called, um, is about using your senses and uh, mapping the environment with sensory perception, um, which was used in, in uh, uh, and each of these tells where it, there's, each of these things is published with the, um, the list of, of courses in which it has been taught um, or with it, with in which it was tested. And also some example, there are um, instructor stories from 
you know, teaching the materials in that particular class and how they adapted them. So when I say we had a lot of supporting materials, we really had a lot of supporting um, materials. Um, so, you know, mapping with sensory perception, with sensory perception was used in um, a, a 200 level composition course. It was used in a um, upper divisional environmental justice course, and it was used in a introductory environmental course. So you can kind of see, and you can, you can cr cruise your way through these. I have to say that I ran the whole project. And so I actually did not, I'm not the person who really knows the modules, <laughs> the deep content of the modules the best. So, so does that well, I, help? Yeah, that that's great. And I, I really like the thinking outside the box. I don't think we have discussed um, that level of creativity within our committee yet. You know, we've been talking a lot about the interdisciplinary nature of acoustics and how it's both in ocean science, engineering, animal bioacoustics, et cetera. Yep. But I, I personally have never thought of um, reaching out into the humanities, for an example. Um, and there, there are a lot of societal issues related to the use of underwater sound sources by people, for example, um, that would lend itself nicely to to reaching out beyond um you know just the scientific borders so th that was that was great thank you we found that it was easier i mean the engineering was an uh, was a and you know that's a close cousin so that was e relatively straightforward but but like it would have been wonderful if we had gotten geoscience into biology or geoscience <laughs> into physics and that's the harder lift and we, it was also much easier to get societal issues into introductory geoscience than it was to get it into the upper division um and uh, you know i i don't i'm not sure from a so, so there are a lot of motivations for doing this we had a two prong goal one was a workforce goal but the other was just a science literacy you know environmental literacy goal so um you and know those those are the exact goals that we are looking at right now. And I think that you, um, the social sciences that you talked about, that is a challenge for us. And we need to meet that challenge as a field. And you're tying it to societal needs and conflict like food security or energy security. That's where acoustics can come into non-acoustics or even um technical science classes yeah. the social yeah. sciences there's a lot that we have not even dipped our toe in the pond yet and i think that i'm looking at the website that you put in the chat and that is inspiration for our field thank you for sharing something concrete that we can actually cite and like put in our report that's fantastic because this is something that has been has been tried and works so um yeah. So I, one thing I would say, so I want to say two things because I realized, so I didn't answer a whole question earlier, which is that ideas for these modules, we put out calls for proposals. So we didn't, we had some things that we um, really wanted to accomplish. Like we wanted to get a whole introductory curriculum. So we put out a call that, a series of calls that was really about, was evaluated, the proposals were evaluated against what are what's missing? What what do we need to have a complete course? So it was not a you know what do, what do you want to teach? You know what do you want to do? Anything goes. It was really you know we're looking for these topics that integrate societal issues into these things that form the introductory curriculum. We what we also had just plain open calls. We're just looking for things that really integrate across broadly across the curriculum, and that was where we really had this rigid rule that you know you can propose anything you want, but you have to have a geoscientist and you have to have somebody who's not a geoscientist and you have to have three faculty who are willing to teach this. And um, so, you know, that combination um, worked well. We really wanted some engineering modules. We recruited those specifically and we hold, held that um, specific um, workshop and event. And we did, we wanted some teacher preparation modules. So we, there were some modules that were um, co-developed with people from the teacher education community or from the teacher education faculty. When you put your call for proposals out, was that internal to your university? Were these call for proposals just within your university or did you um, look to team with people outside of your university? Oh, this was entirely a national scale effort. So national in fact, Carleton effort. was hardly involved at all. Okay, that was my <laughs> There were, I think, two or three faculty from Carleton, but they just went into the same 
pile as anybody as everybody else. It was a national call. We used, um, I think, you know, when we were trying to find um, geoscientists, uh, particularly solid earth geoscientists, we had a strong community we could advertise to, just like you have a strong ocean acoustics community you can advertise to. When we were going, trying to find, you know, biologists or English faculty, there are these workshops that were recruiting workshops became particularly important because they were a, a mechanism for identifying people. And I don't, you know, this was all pre-pandemic and I don't know exactly um, what those would look like now because you had to get, you had to get people together. We, they were, they were two and a half days long when we did them face-to-face -face workshops. And that was short enough people would come um, at, but long enough that people got to know each other well enough to have these teams start to gel and ideas start to gel. And um, I don't know if you can get people to come for two and a half days anymore. You know, I, you'd have to really think about, you know, what the what the equivalent there is um, or when what you, the. When you did your call for proposals, that was. So you had a large NSF grant that you secured. And then you did a call for proposals within the scope of work for your funded NSF grant. So you got you got funding to go out and do this. So you had a sponsor. That's we had ten million dollars that had to be spent over of five years. Dollars to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and not just for the materials development. The whole program was a ten million dollar. No, that's program. great. And I was just wondering how whether you did that call for proposals before you applied for NSF or you had the idea posed it to NSF and then you did the call for proposals as the scope of work. Yeah, this was unusual because NSF came out with this 10 mil, I think this was a congressional earmark in all honesty, okay. came out with this one time $10 million center proposal. Um, they were step centers. There were only two awarded, one in geoscience, one in engineering. They were looking for one in biology and didn't make an award. And, um, you know, so lots of money, really fast burn time. And we use that. Um, we use that to do both the the curriculum development and then also the institutional adaptations of it. So it was sort of a two and and the development of a large dissemination campaign. So it was a sort of three scale program. That's all written up in the about this project um, that's, part that's of the website. On your website. Oh, there yeah. it is. I see it. Perfect. And and actually, so there was a huge lift involved in developing. So a hundred faculty, over a little over a hundred faculty were involved in the curriculum development project. And that was more faculty that you you had to have a system to manage that many gotcha. um, faculty writing modules. And so that system was a big lift to develop. And it's now being used by other projects. So um uh uh, UNAVCO, the Getsy project, is doing applications using the same curriculum development strategy, not as, mu as much money, so they're not paying their people as much, so they've skinnied it down, but they're pr also producing modules using pretty much the same, um, you know, the same strategy of, of, of developing faculty teams, having a, a evaluation structure that um, leads to the revision of the materials and then publishes them online. Um, and then I, you, this one, this is another project that's using the same sort of infrastructural approach. And um, and this one is um, business and science. So it's from, uh, it's led out of Bentley University and it integrates across the business school and the science school. Cool. So that's, so, that's, you know, exactly so what we're that's something for. to think about is that you don't have to invent it all from scratch. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. you. I know that we are ending our, our 30 minutes. It passes so fast. Um, any other last minute comments from um, the committee members? Kathy, any parting words from you as we continue our quest to gather information in this area? Um, I'm happy to, you know, I, I'm happy to talk with you further. Um, uh, I think this is only one strategy. I tried to think about sort of the, um, sort of bigger picture. And of course, geoscience has been trying to raise its profile forever, as are all the little parts of geoscience, which I would include you in. Yeah. I call you a little part, but I called you a part. No, <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and I there I think that and connecting to the workforce, if I was going to do this again, the Ooh. thing that we didn't do explicitly that I would would do is to, so the materials had a, there were five guiding principles and all the materials had to meet them. 
you can find those on the website. But they, they, had, they had to address a uh, societal issue. They had to um, develop habits of mind. They had to develop complex systems thinking. Uh, so there are five of those. And we that's what we evaluated against. I, I would have made one of them explicitly. I would have made six and made one of them connections to the workforce. So that that really came through um, okay. more explicitly. That's a, that's a great learning lesson. So, Connecting and then I to... also would, I mean, I, another strategy I think is worth really thinking about is, is just going straight after the workforce connections and thinking about how internships are engaging with, um, you know, what are the internship, uh, what, if you start with a physics student or a, or a ocean sciences student or a different kind of student as an undergraduate, what, what, how do you make a path that goes to an internship so they get to tr or a research experience that um, build, you know, adds enough to their um, major or subs in the stuff in their major so that they're prepared for that internship and gives them an opportunity to really try ocean acoustics early on, uh, relatively early on before they're a graduate student. So Th thank you. Um, I thank you for. Um spending this time with us and trying to respect your time and the time of the committee members. But I always leave with this thought. If you're driving home or cooking dinner tonight and think about, oh, I should have said this or I should have turned them on to this website, please get in touch with me or anyone on the committee or at the academies and, and just drop us a quick note. We're, we're always happy to discuss more. And especially this has been so helpful. I've taken two full pages of notes, the things that um, that I found it's just in inspirational that we could we could learn from. Um, and thank you for putting the, the websites in there. That's something that we can continue to go back to and see in writing. So I appreciate that also. Um, but mostly just thank you for doing what you do. What, what you're doing is hard. And um, geosciences as a whole, I hope they appreciate all of your effort because I certainly <laughs> know that it's not easy. And hearing about everything that you've been involved in, um, yeah, you've got accolades from me. I hope we can do half as good of job here with the ocean acoustics community. Well, I'm sure you can, and I wish you every success. So thank you all. It was fun to talk with you. Thanks, so. Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> nice bye to bye meet bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.